It's been over a week now, and the entire world has been captured by the destruction that has taken place in the light in the aftermath of Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. And as we see those harsh images, we're moved. Our hearts are filled with pity. Tears can easily come to your eyes because the devastation is just so catastrophic. It's amazing what Google Maps can do. They show you these before and after uh, images of complete towns that once were places where people lived and dwelt, and now there's nothing left but utter chaos and ruin. Our hearts, our prayers go out to those living in the Philippines, to the Filipino community here in southern New England. We pray that through the efforts of the international community and our own efforts, uh, the assistance that they need to rebuild their lives, the hope that they need to have put back into their hearts will be a reality that comes from our efforts. I've given a lot of thought to those images and to the widespread destruction that took place a little over a week ago in the Philippines. And destruction is a real, well, it's just reality. Destruction happens. It happens all the time. Destruction can happen in our homes. Destruction can happen within the family unit. Destruction can happen in the workplace. But I want to focus my attention this evening on a different type of destruction. Really, the main purpose of this weekend of reconciliation and healing. Now, to our confirmation students, I want you to pay particular attention to what I'm about to say. <coughs> because maybe this hasn't been a reality in your life yet. You're still young. 13, 14, 15. But there's a different type of destruction that I want to focus on. I believe it's my role and my responsibility to talk about it in a very frank and candid way. That's the type of destruction that has taken place within the life of the church. Destruction. That's right. Now, I've been a priest for 12 years. And I was ordained in July. And just six months later, the reality that sexual abuse of minors and cover-ups and payoffs was all just kind of like a major tsunami that came down from Boston. And then it just swept through the country. <coughs> that type of destruction is a reality that you and I as Catholics, as Christians, have been forced to endure. The moral credibility of the church has been challenged and shaken, and rightly so. Rightly so. <coughs> but with destruction comes the possibility of something else. But I want to stay focused on the destruction for just a couple of moments. If that's just one example of destruction. There are so many other types, types of destruction. The parent who comes to me and says, I no longer go to church because the last time I was there, I felt so judged by the person sitting next to me. A couple of weeks ago, I shared with those at Mass that a young man went to extend his hand, and he happened to have a couple of tattoos on his hand. And the elderly parishioner pulled her hand away and wouldn't shake his hand because she judged him. He's got tattoos all over his hand. He must be bad. He felt so judged and hurt, he shared with me that he stopped coming to church for years. The person who doesn't feel accepted or welcome, because in the eyes of some people, they are different or not welcome here. Well, with the full support of my parish staff and the parish council, we need to do something to help begin to rebuild the trust and credibility of our church. Everything begins at home. <coughs> sure, some of this is coming down from the Francis effect. The fact that he is empowering us to embrace that gospel and to spread the message that as we sang tonight, all are welcome, that is the reality. 
I know it's a little difficult for those who even came in the front door. There is a, there's a banner that hangs, that proudly hangs, that proclaims, Welcome home. And so I say tonight, if you have ever been hurt by the church in any way whatsoever, I'm sorry. If you have ever been alienated by the church because of something that happened to you or something that happened to a loved one, to someone that happened to a family member, I'm sorry. I'm the public face of the church here in Dartmouth. <coughs> And I need to take that role of responsibility seriously. Jesus said, what shepherd would not leave the 99 behind and go out searching for the one lost one? Someone challenged me just, just, just this past week. I, I, read, I, read, I read that article. Oh, yeah, you know, in the Standard Times, you and Benny, you, you had all these great ideas. What's the point? What's the point? I'll tell you what the point is. It was the last line of the gospel. Who remembers what the last line of the gospel that we heard proclaimed tonight? By your perseverance, you will secure your lives. We need to be a people of perseverance. We need to look and be a people. We need to be a people who look in the face of destruction and not simply see that which is destroyed, but we can see that which can be rebuilt. And it takes everyone. It takes us all putting in our heart and our souls, knowing that all are welcome here. And so tonight, if you fit into that category, for whatever reason, if you've ever been hurt, like I have been hurt by the church, I never thought that I would have to stand and apologize for the sins and the crimes for others. The church has let me down too. But I don't focus on that. I focus on the fact that a community of faith wants to persevere. A community of faith doesn't just focus on destruction, but focuses on the hope of what we can become. A Christian community that builds one another up, even when we're pushed down. My friends, if tonight you are here, because someone has invited you, I simply say two words. <coughs> Welcome home.